So, you want to look into the abyss? The abyss wants to look at you. Give me your eyes. <laughs> so, you want to start a cult? It's not that hard. Pretty much any godling with half a brainstem can manage it these days. What's that? You're not a godling? Mm, whatever. You just gave me your eye so you can say east now, and the average bloke doesn't know the difference. You're confused? I suppose I should start at the beginning then. Step one of starting a cult. Figure out your branding. What values do you want to pretend to represent? What is your stated core objective? What's the object of your worship? You can just lie about all of this, of course, but it'll go a long way in convincing people to join in a short, concise pitch. Whatever it is should feed into your future followers' anxieties and problems and offer solutions to them. And it can be helpful to know why you want to start a cult for yourself, for your own personal motivations. For example, I'm Eris, goddess of the abyss, magic, and chaos. I was here at the beginning, and I will be here when it ends. No one has ever particularly liked me. I mean, sure, they built entire societies around my power, but they never liked me. But there are many people out there like that. Clever, driven people who go out of their way to do everything right, and still, no one likes them. Here, in the cult of Eris, they're welcome. They'll be loved. They will be seen. <laughs> but maybe you're not about that. Maybe you're like my sister, and you're like, Oh, my religion is about healthy communities and interdependent living and blah, 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 blah. You're all sheep and I'm breeding you for the parasites in your brains. <laughs> Ugh, what a little caddisfly artist. You want some more examples? I guess I'll just go over all the godlings then. At least the ones I've talked to recently. Oldest to youngest. Well, all of us were born in pairs. Eris and Zeus. Ocean and air, fire and earth, beginnings and endings, eternity and ephemera, etc. You get it. Asarlai and Aselli were the first godlings to take on human forms. Asarlai built his cult mostly in the north. They call him the god of magic and winter and secrets there. He taught some of the first humans writing and magic. They pray to him when they cut out their eyes to see magic, and they have this whole row chant thing that for crossing the lake where they think he lives. And he comes and talks to them when they're dying, so god of death too. And sometimes fatherhood. Gods, he's really overdoing it with all these titles. <laughs> Asele taught them to sing. She's the goddess of music, autumn, and the arts. But it's kind of like the wino anth of the pantheon. Don't tell anyone I ever said so. Her cult is built around pursuing self-expression and following everyone's flights of fancy. By the way, she and her husband Danvir made the dragons. That wasn't me, despite what my sister says. Speaking of Danvir, he and Damir are twin gods too. Damir is the goddess of earth, spring, life, motherhood, the hearth. You get the gist. Her worshippers are anyone who's just cleaning their house and home, or cooking, or singing, or whatever. They have her runes and wreaths above their hearth to keep their dinners from burning, and above their doors and windows to freshen the smell. Damir is the kind of goddess with a good heart, but... Well, there are plenty of people who will take advantage of the belief that cleaning is holy to manipulate others to do slave labor for them. <laughs> Danfir is the goddess of summer fire and conquest. He doesn't like me. They beat his name into swords and teach fire-starting songs in his names. Some warriors and strategians dedicate themselves to his name. But even spies and historians will study and debate the battle strategies he left them. Beginnings and endings don't really have cults anymore. Not ever since the Black King figured out how to end the god's existence permanently. The Black King killed the Black Red Monarch for basically no reason other than curiosity, and then made their body into the demon. Even I haven't done fratricide. There are some demonic blood cults in the south who are trying to recoalesce his power by feeding it into the demons hiding down there. They have all sorts of elaborate rituals around kidnapping and sacrificing blood to Kivik, but who knows if any of that will even work. And lastly, some of the youngest, Ephemera and Eternity. They don't live here, but last I heard, Eternity cultivated a following around sharing her power. She's built this whole little continent-wide 
uh, system that if you pray in her name and whatever you describe will happen. As you can imagine, words are highly prized and she has whole cities who adore her. Uh, Ephemera is pretty unreliable in comparison. Like Aselle, whimsical and free, but she has certain vindictiveness that Aselle doesn't. Like one time, she made a deal with the Selkies that if they gave her her skin, she would save them from the dangers of the ocean. But then when some regretted it later, she turned their sealskins to ash before giving them back. For Selkies, that's like their soul. It's pretty hardcore. But I've done worse. If you acclimate your followers well enough, you can basically do anything. I suppose that brings us to step two. Get them to dabble in cult shit so they start saying yes. And once you habituate them into saying yes to the little things, it becomes harder to say no, they'll feel too bad. In this phase, it's important to figure out your followers' pain points, problems, and fears. What sort of things are they interested in? What sort of problems do they face in their daily life? And then, it's also very important to give them lots of gifts in this phase. I think some people call this love bombing. We'll start with my gift. East magic. The problem or fear that it tackles is that society is unfair and it hates me. So you start out with a small gift. A natural born mage will come to help them. But the inconvenience? The mage isn't always around. So now it's time for the small ass. Just sacrifice your eye for the chance to become a mage. And then, once they do, you give them a the big gift, the ability to see and manipulate East. And that's how they get their magic. So, I suppose I should explain what yeast does, actually. Yeast is particles that float in the air. Uh, they're sort of a part of me, but not really. It's complicated. You wouldn't understand. Uh, but when they hit each other at certain directions or in certain speeds, spontaneous effects occur. So seeing yeast particles is like predicting how to create these effects. And then they're much easier to do. If you sacrifice one eye into an east spring, you have a chance at being able to see them. And yes, it does take years to learn how to manipulate east, but shh, don't tell them that. They want easy answers. Another example is the one used by Kivik, blood magic. You see, a common problem or fear that people have, especially in the south, is that uh, demons can easily hurt you, but they can't be defeated so easily. So a small way to get them hooked in the occult is to offer them protection from demons. That's what the Kivit cult does. However, the Kivit cult also asks for a tithe, and the tithes are very expensive. I mean, they rack up pretty fast, and you don't want to always be worried about if you're going to die or not, right? So then we can do a bigger ask. Sacrifice your blood for the sake of the community. If you give your blood, we'll protect everybody you care about, not just you. And once the community starts agreeing to that, then the demons will heal and shapeshift anybody in the community so that they all can stay healthy and happy. <laughs> Convenient, right? But you might be asking, what is blood magic actually? That's the remnants of the Red Monarch himself in the demons. Demons can use blood magic to heal and shapeshift and anything else really to do with blood. And since all the demons are technically all part of one godling, they all feel each other's emotions because they were all formerly part of one divine organism. And this has really increased empathy in demon communities. Plus, it makes it easier to ostracize outsiders when they can't feel the bond that you have with everybody else. And that's very important because if you ostracize outsiders, then there's an in-group and an out-group, and uh, you don't want to mess with the out-group. You just want to hang out with your buddies in the in-group, and you feel comfortable and safe. The Kifit cults, therefore, are demons who all fear humans, or at least um, are people infused with demon blood who think that they're demons and fear humans. <laughs> we won't get into it, though, because they aren't that crazy about facts, so why should we be? Step 3. Get past the distasteful elements. You see, most people won't bounce off of the distasteful elements of your cult because they secretly agree with them. Or if they don't agree with it, at the very least they'll gaslight themselves into thinking that the downsides are an acceptable cause. For example, my sister has decided that everybody in her cult should hate demons. But demons didn't do anything wrong generally. I mean, yeah, sure they eat people and drink their blood and they need to do that to survive and I'm sure that humans find this very distasteful. But like, they can't do anything about it. They were just born that way. It's not their fault. But it's really easy to hate demons. And then, 
Once you say, oh, well, demons are dangerous because they eat people, then you extrapolate this to people who are friends with demons are dangerous because they tolerate people eating people. And then you say, anyone who mentions anything demonic at all mm, are dangerous because they're supporting demons eating people. And now, suddenly, mm, if you have any hint of demonic culture, even if that's something as simple as wearing their silk clothes or expressing your sexuality, um, now you're a demon lover and everybody hates you because they know that you're dangerous because you tolerate demons. This kind of purity culture will definitely, absolutely protect Yulia's community. And it absolutely won't ostracize people unnecessarily for, uh, I don't know, liking things that are kind of neat and basic to human nature. But who has ever been concerned about purity culture? <laughs> Step 4. Get followers involved in analysis and content creation. For example, you want them to write holy books and songs, and then some people, maybe they want to write essays about uh, the holy books and songs, and you can get people to build up a whole philosophy about the things that you said and what they mean. It's really important to get the community involved at this phase, even if they're wildly wrong about the things that you said. It's not important to actually control or direct your community. It's just important to get them to be involved and engage. For example, in the South, the demon lords each named themselves after a constellation, and they told the humans at the time, as a way to control them, that the stars meant that they were special in certain ways. However, all the demons really used it for is as a way to know when to care for and when to breed the humans that they were raising. Humans were basically livestock like 2,000 years ago, but, you know, they got over it. But this came to be the basis of modern Southern astrology. And now they have names that mean certain things. Like, for example, if you're born in this specific month, you're good at overcoming hardship. Even though what it means in this month is that they have to feed you extra food because there's not a lot of food around. See, I understand that in your world, there's a lot of people that really like to misinterpret things like this. As I understand, there's lots of people in your world who will also do this sort of thing. For example, flat earthers. They love to look at old maps and they go, oh, the maps are flat. That means that the earth is flat. The ancient people knew the earth was flat. And then because the ancient people knew the earth was flat and the ancient people also knew that uh, Jews ate children, then they conclude that Jews today must still eat children. And this creates a very bad situation, which by the way, isn't true. They don't. Step five, get them accustomed to the way the cult sees things. This creates an echo chamber effect, where commonalities will make them feel smart and safe. When you start getting people really good at seeing and interpreting things through the cult's lens of the world, that means that it will be easier for them to see the cult everywhere, and it will constantly remind them of the cult, and they won't be able to stop thinking about it. And by thinking about it more, they'll assume that means that it's better, because humans are great like that. Plus, then when they start leaving the community, they'll realize how scary it is because everyone disagrees with them. That's why evangelizing is so great. It makes people go out into their wider communities and then they realize that not everybody shares their worldviews and that's scary. So they return to their fellow cult members because their fellow cult members are the only ones who they feel truly understand them. And that's why getting your cult members to evangelize, especially to pass on the paradigm with which your cult thinks is extremely important. Step six, the cult must promise to silence your enemies. Dehumanizing your enemies is extremely important to creating the in-group and out-group of the cult, like I mentioned earlier. Enemies are anyone who disagrees or questions the cult, even if they're just asking questions. Did you know that just asking questions is actually a logical fallacy? You claim that you're just asking questions, but actually, people who are just asking questions are trying to poke holes in things and perpetuate their own beliefs. Once you make it clear that anyone who disagrees with the cult is an enemy, you can dehumanize and demonize them. Once they're seen as less human, as once they're seen as not people, then you can do whatever you want to them and the cult won't care. Plus, outsiders who fear you enough might just decide to join. And here's the bonus step seven, doomsday. If you are running a doomsday cult, because not everybody is, um, they'll eventually realize that your doomsday predictions are wrong. 
because they are. The world's gonna just keep going on, basically. When Doomsday doesn't happen, your cult members will realize, or rather, they will realize, that they have to make the Doomsday happen themselves, that they are the chosen ones, chosen to make the Doomsday happen. In this phase, you must encourage your followers to organize and take action. Did God tell you that he'd overthrow the corrupt government for you? Or is God working through you to overthrow the corrupt government? And for the record, I, of course, have no love for insurgents who love their country. Because if they're insurgents, that means they already failed. And they're idiots. If they didn't fail, they would be the rightful rulers of the land. <laughs> and with that, I'd say that's basically the whole process. Eris! Oh, hi there, cutie. Get the hell out of my room. I'm warning Are people... Are you filming? ...about the dangers of cults and brainwashing and the... No. ...dangers out. of moral Now. Panic. Make me. I'm telling Diakase. What? No, wait, please. I just wanted to help. Arlisair. Arlisair, come back.